Welcome everybody to the New Jersey video series. Today, our guest is legendary goalkeeper, Tony Miola, uh, New Jersey native, 100 caps for the US, uh, World Cup 1990, 1994, 2002, and over 300 Pro games. Uh, I had the pleasure of watching Tony live in 1994, where he and his he and his team, I think, uh, were the reason that um, planted a, a big seed into the the US soccer landscape. Uh, Tony, welcome, man. James, good to, good to uh, hear your voice. By the way, 1994, that was only like five years ago, right? That, that was it? That, that wasn't that long ago, was it? Yeah, yeah, that's right, mate. <laughs> I could keep telling myself that, right? But, yeah, it's good to hear your voice. Thanks for having me. No worries. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you grew up in, in New Jersey, obviously, North Jersey, I'm taking it. Uh, tell us a little bit about where you grew up, my man. Yeah, so I grew up in Kearney, um, New Jersey, and, and anyone who has, wants to get an idea of what Kearney looks like right now, the uh, the documentary uh, Soccer Town USA just came out, uh, so they can go on YouTube and watch that, and you'll get an idea, and I think you'll see um, in watching that that I grew up in a very unique place. Um, I was I was one of with my best friend Sal Rosamilia, one of two Italian families in town, but other than that, it was all Scottish and English. Um, everybody was first generation, um, like, like was a, a lot of towns in northern New Jersey. But we, we, we were a group where we were a town, at least, where if, if you played soccer, and, and again, you're going back to the mid-80s and, and late 80s, um, if you played soccer um, anywhere outside of Carney, you probably weren't in the cool group, right? You probably weren't in that group where everyone said, oh, yeah, that's what I want to do. Um, but we, we, where we were, that's what everybody wanted to do. That's the only thing everybody wanted to do was play and play 24 hours a day. Um, you know, and I'm sure we'll get into it at some point. I think the one thing that we probably miss now in this country for as organized as we are, we miss the unorganized stuff. We miss the going out in the street with your friends. And look, I have three kids that have played sports two that are in college. One that's going to play in college in different sports. Um, and I tell them all the time it doesn't always have to be structured all the time. It doesn't, there doesn't have to be a cone on the, uh, on the field. When we were waiting to get into school in the morning, we would play across the street from two cars and underneath the, the wheel wells of the cars were the goal. And we used the tennis ball and we played two on twos and you can go down our, almost our entire street and, and see games going on, you know, and, and, um, it's just, things have changed. A lot of it is for the better. Uh, but when I, when I read the stories, the Messi books, the Ronaldo books, uh, all the way back to Pele, when I read all of that stuff, you know, everyone says they learn the most uh, being on the street. And I think, as I mentioned, uh, you'll see in that Soccer Town USA, we grew up in a very unique area. I, I hope we get a little bit more of that incorporated into our sort of daily routines here in the U.S. But that, that also sort of has to become part of the soccer soccer culture um in uh, in this country if you will yeah that's that's fantastic man because you you hit on uh some of the subjects that i, I want to talk about uh so obviously the kids are at home now and and they're spending a lot of time uh at home and and i know when i coach and obviously from your messaging you feel so passionate about it um you, you obviously uh, credit the street and those playing games with freedom um, a lot to the success of not only yourself but obviously all the all the kids that you grew up with. Um, so talk about some of the, the 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 games or the activities they used to do playing with freedom, like you said, unstructured. Like I love the one with the the cars, the the wheels. Um, what else did you used to do um, when you were a kid, both at home? like inside your house, if you did, and outside on the street with your buddies? Well, you know, the one thing I did at my house, we had, uh, we lived in a two family house and we had stairs that were going up on an angle and we were the, my, my mom and dad owned the house. Um, and my mom tells the story all the time to all my relatives. She would sit, you know, while she was cooking and she'd hear the ball just bouncing against the wall over and over hundreds and hundreds of times a day. It's funny because I go back to my mom and dad's now and they still live in the exact same house. And my dad always used to sort of 
yell about how the bricks would be chipping as I would continue to hit the wall, you know, and eventually you're going to wear the wall out. So I started using different targets on the wall because I don't want to wear out the same bricks on the wall. You know, I didn't want to get yelled at. And, and I go there now and I look at how small an area it is, right? Obviously, um, we, we play in 11 v 11 size fields and I look, it's, it's a two car driveway. Um, and I spent, I can remember spending hours. I got my first soccer ball from my dad's cousin who had just, who was a big Boca Junior fan. Boca Juniors was the one team in, that I wanted to play for. I'm an AC Milan fan to watch, and that's who I grew up sort of liking, but I always wanted to as a pro play at Boca down in Argentina, that Boca River rivalry. My dad's cousin brought a, a, a yellow soccer ball home from Argentina as a gift one year, and I was probably, I don't know, it's probably six years old at the time, and I wore that thing out. Um, until I was playing against the factory wall on the weekend and I actually kicked the ball a little bit too high. It broke the window, went into the factory and the factory was closed. So I couldn't get the soccer ball. And I went there during the week with my parents. Nobody could tell me where this, my soccer ball was. That's how I lost my first soccer ball. But, um, the, those moments, those, those, I, I think again, like going to, to the street and playing at the courts, Every single night, that was religion for us. And we went from school. You know, it's funny. One of my teammates, um, who you guys know in New Jersey, Mike O'Neill, um, yeah. who's at PDA on the on the women's side, helped start PDA with Jeremy Q. And you guys, I'm sure, have done a lot of things with him. Mike yeah. in the documentary says, we played soccer three times before we went to training. <laughs> and he's so right. He said, we played soccer before school, at lunchtime, and after school. And then we went to training a couple nights a week, you know, and that was just the culture that I grew up in. So I was really, really lucky. But uh, again, those little moments on the wall, right? Those little moments where you're just working on your own thing. No, no coaches, no one is telling you, this is how you should touch the ball. And this is use this part of you. No, you're figuring it all out on your own. Right. And that's, that, that's the beauty of our game. It doesn't to get better. It doesn't take a lot. And of course, in, in this period of time, when um, you know we can't be with groups of people, we can't we can't be with our team. We can't be playing five v fives right now. Um, this is an opportunity, maybe, to work on some of those things. And this is what we're telling the kids down at our club here in Florida. Um, this is a time where you can work on some of those things, maybe that you didn't you don't get to touch because everything is so organized. And you can work on your juggling, and and you can work on you know. Uh, we have kids sending videos in and they don't have cones at their house, but they're throwing socks down on the floor. Uh, one girl used a couple of bricks from her backyard and she's dribbling through the brick. I mean, she, th this is the time to create. This is your time. Um, and, and I guess sort of the, the, the big picture is take, take what's maybe a negative right now in our lives and, and try and at least in our game, turn it into a little bit of a positive. Yeah, a hundred percent. I love, I love what you're, uh, what you're spitting out here, mate. It's fantastic. Um, so your, your parents were Italians off the boat. Yep. From first generation here, my dad uh, played at the youth club in Avellino, um, but was, was done way before any, any idea of um, becoming a pro, you know, there was just a youth club at the time. And um he he had to come to America to work, you know. So right. the the best thing about my career, and I, I think about this on a personal note all the time. I don't really. I'm um, anyone who knows me. I never really look back at what I did. I'm always kind of looking forward and how we can make it grow. But when I do look back, you know, I, I at least got to live out the the dream a little bit that my father had his whole life. Uh -huh. Um, and and he, you know, he was so good about. And I hope I do the same thing with my kids, although the two boys are playing on the baseball side now. My daughter still plays soccer. I hope they get the same feeling that this is this is their time. You know, my father, he, he, he wanted to do it but couldn't, but he got to sort of live it through my career, you know, but never felt like it was any part of his career. This was my doing and this was this was my time and my career and my way of doing it. Um, and you know, that's, that's kind of how my family, um, I, I think did it for me. It's so special to do what my father wanted to do, um, and, and kind of live it out for him. So he could, he could have still those moments, um, to kind of get into the game. And he got into it a little bit different than I did because I was playing, but, um, he, he was, according to my mom, 
<clears throat> he was no less intense in the stands than I was on the field. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I was going to talk about uh, parent, parent involvement and um, uh, parent support uh, a little bit later on. But since you, you, you touched on it with your parents, um, so I, I think that at, as state associations, national associations and clubs, I don't think we do enough to educate the parents. And I feel that, um, you know, they play the biggest part in, in all this and they can either really uh, help nurture a career or they can destroy a career. Um, what, through your time, you obviously must have, have and you probably still see, uh, parents that are that are disrupting players and players that are and and parents that are nurturing um, players. What tell us a few crazy stories that you saw of or you've seen of of parents actually hurt some talented players growing up or even now as a as a as a coach and vice versa. Parents that you saw that actually helped pave the way. Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm I I, I kind of touch on this all the time. I'm not one ever to tell anyone how to parent their kid, right? I, and I, nor is there one way to do it. I'll, I'll tell you a, a quick story. But another New Jersey guy, Peter Vermes, um, we were in. He was a, a technical director at Blue Valley, uh, which is now the Sporting Kansas City uh, Youth Club. But this is before he was coaching at Sporting Kansas City, and he brought me into a room, and he said. Uh, do you recognize this voice? And he played a vet m uh, message on his, uh, on his office um, uh, message machine. And the guy was going on about how he'd like to start making, um, uh, making uh, videos for colleges. And he feels like his, his son is developing into it. It was pretty logical conversation. Nothing kind of out, out of the ordinary the parent would say, but he sees his son excelling. Um, he thinks he could be a D1 player. And it was a really good club, and it didn't sound like a, a sort of an awkward conversation at all. And then he said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the guy's name, but he said, this is your neighbor that lives down – we were in Kansas City at the time. He said, this is your neighbor that lives down the block for you. And I said, oh, you know what? I thought I recognized the voice. And I kind of stopped in my tracks, and I said, Pete, hold on. His kid plays with my kid. He said, yeah, they were nine years old at the time he's talking about his nine-year-old and talking about videos for college and how he needs to get him exposure. And, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, man, he's got it all wrong. Like at that age, the first thing, the, the first question should be, did you have fun today? Right. Did you have fun today? What did you learn? You know, we learn in all these coaching schools, especially now I just went the two years ago, I went through the, the new a course, the pro a course. And, and, um, you know, the, the whole thing about leading, que leading questions, leading your players, you know, so what did you think? How did you feel? Um, not, you know, I, I joke about my dad as, as much as I don't think my dad ever pushed me. He was too busy working. He just wanted to enjoy the games. But I joke uh, about an old Italian saying, which basically he used to say, well, what happened, you know, on this play? And I'd say, well, you know, the guy was going here and the, you know, the other guy was running over here. And I thought, and as soon as I say the word, I thought he would tell me all the time, don't think you're not equipped, right? <laughs> That's what he would say to me all the time. Don't think you're not equipped. And as trite a saying as that is, the great players don't think. And that's what he was trying to tell me, right? He, he always used to try to, he was always trying to tell me, if you think it's too late, right? By the time you think about it, it's too late. You just have to react to it. And I kind of use that all the time. But as far as parenting goes, everyone does it differently. Um, again, I told you, my kids all played soccer, but now as they're older, my, my oldest playing baseball in, in college. Uh, my youngest is a junior who will be playing uh, Division One baseball in college. My daughter plays soccer at the Division Two level. Um, and I have been out um, countless hours outside over the years with them, either kicking a soccer ball, playing basketball, uh, throwing a baseball, going to the batting cages. And as many hours as I've put in with them, I never once asked them to go outside. It was always predicated on them saying, dad, can we go outside and throw dad? Can we go outside and shoot hoops? Do you want to go play some soccer? Do you want to do? And I, I just always thought the best thing about it was that I was giving them a love for doing something. Right. Because if I ask them all the time, I don't every kid is different. But if I would have asked my kids every day, 
you know, after two days, they would have said, no, I don't want to go. So it was always up to them to tell me, um, and I can't tell you, I've had the worst shoulder, right shoulder. It's not from diving 3,000 times a week in soccer. It's from throwing a baseball all the time, you know. And I, I just I, I thought to myself, I need to make them love the game. And, and I got the best example um, about, about a year ago, just before we moved down to uh, Florida. My daughter walked in the house when she came back from college, and I was watching a Champions League game. It was actually, I can tell you the game. It was Liverpool's game against Barcelona when they came back in Anfield last year and knocked them out on the Trent Alexander-Arnold uh, quick corner kick. And my daughter sat down with me. And she's, of course, she's 18 years old. And, and anyone who has an 18-year-old daughter knows that they probably got better things to do than sit on the couch with their dad. Of course, I'm doing work at that point. And she wanted to watch the game with me. Right. And, and she used to sit all the time and watch. And she still does when games are on. We watch all the women's games together. She, we, we only live 20 minutes from her school now. So she comes home to watch the women's game or she's watching with her teammates. And I know that I just instilled a love for the game. If they don't love what they're doing, it doesn't matter how good they are. They're going to eventually get burned down. And I know people have heard that all the time. Uh, I've heard that over the years, but some people listen to it. Some people don't. But I, I would, I, I don't think that theory is, is still too old to learn. I still think that theory is the same. Just let them enjoy it first. Um, as far as parenting on the sidelines and things like that, I tell, I used to tell all my clubs when I was coaching, the first meeting I had, I would get all the parents together the first night and I'd say, you guys are so lucky. You don't have to worry about coaching. You don't have to worry about yelling at referees. You don't have to worry about screaming at anybody on the field, telling you, I'm going to do all of that for you, <laughs> right? <laughs> you just became the biggest cheerleader in the entire state. That's your job is to be a cheerleader, right? Way and, to put it. Yeah, and I used to say, I, I take care of all that for you. So you can just go here and enjoy the game. And, and, of course, I never really had any parental problems with parents coaching from the sideline in my teams, any of that stuff. I think they all kind of trusted me. And, yeah. uh, but that's kind of my, my, my theory in general. Yeah, I think um, I, I think the key thing was there. You see how you said that uh, you know your kids would come up and ask you to go out and play. It's because because you made it fun and you didn't put pressure on them, obviously. Um, and when they made mistakes, you were okay with it. You wouldn't critique them, I'm guessing. And 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 it was just fun for them to be out there with you, right? Yeah. Well, I would correct them, no doubt, because they they needed that's what they wanted, right? And, and as far as putting pressure on them, I will say this. I don't know that I put pressure on them their whole life that said, this is what you have to do. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I didn't want my kids ever to be a goalkeeper. I'm happy my boys play. I love that they played soccer. They were very good at soccer. My oldest could have played Division One soccer. Uh, my youngest probably, if he continued, but baseball got got serious really quick in his career. He loved playing a little bit of high school soccer when we were in New Jersey. Um, I the, the pressure I put on them, was, for example, my oldest said, I want to play professional baseball, as my, my youngest does. Um, but when they, when they would say, okay, I'm going to take my training off today, I'm not going to go lift today, or I'm not going to go to the cages today, uh, because I want to do this, right? which, which you could also do. I want to go surf. My oldest is a surfer. I said, okay, well, you can surf all day. I said, but you can't tell me you want to be a professional baseball player but now you're going to go and surf right why don't you go to the cages this morning by the way we had a cage in our backyard in new jersey so it wasn't like you had to go really far for this and we lived down the jersey shore so it's not like the waves were too far away so that's the that, that i don't know if it's pressure more than it was direction you right. know so if right. you say you want to do this then um then you have to do this in order to get to where you want to go then you can do all the other things so Again, I don't know that it's pressure as much as it's more direction from me. But, of course, I, I completely understand. I, I lived a, probably a different life than most of your parents as far as professional sports go. There's probably probably got a couple of professional athletes, you know, uh, moms or dads in your organization. But for the most part, we all lived a little different vision of what, you know, the normal sort of soccer parent is. Right. So I had a little different understanding. Um, but – now, I, I don't think if you asked my kids, they would go, yeah, my dad told me I had to do this or else. You know, that was, that's never been the case. You gave them the keys and you said, put your hands on the steering wheel. This is uh, your journey. I'll, I'll support you. I'll pump the tires up here and there. And you're driving this thing, right? 
that's pretty much how the driving lessons went as well, right? My, <laughs> they will tell you that I was a better driving instructor than my wife was because that's exactly, I took that approach. Maybe not the best idea, but it did work. All right, let's move on a little bit to uh, college, college soccer. Um, obviously, these kids have a lot of pressure now uh, in terms of selecting a college. Um, what's your advice to, to people that are going through the, the college recruitment process? Um, and if you, um, were, a, if you were with a kid and they were about to go into their first training session with their new college team, and in two minutes, they were going to be on the field, what advice would you give that kid? So to pick a college, you know, the parent in me says um, that you pick a college. So I got good advice, uh, you know, when I was going through it. And remember, this is a long time ago, but I only was worried about one thing. I wanted to play the best soccer I could play. Happened to be the best soccer I could play was at one of the best universities in all of America when I went to the University of Virginia. Sure. Um, but my, my parental advice is, and, and I tell kids this all the time, if you could take the, the soccer out of the school, right? If you could take it out, could you survive in school? Could you survive with the atmosphere? Is it the place that has everything that you want that you would love school? Because soccer is the icing on the cake, right? Um, if, you could, if you could go to school and enjoy the school, there's no doubt you can enjoy the soccer part. Um, the, the, the other, but I know if you're, if you're talking to kids that have dreams of being pro, players you know if you're talking to academy kids that are playing at red bull or playing in nycfc or pda they they all have the same dream so they think a little bit differently um my advice would be pick the place that suits you best right that's not always the number one school in the country because how many kids do you know um do we all kind of know being in this business that have gone to places there's one if you're a soccer player there's one thing you want to do you want to play soccer you want to be on the field for a minute, number one. Give, put, put yourself in a position that gives you the best soccer experience that um, you could possibly have. Uh, you also have to take into consideration the school, and I'm sure the parents are taking care of that part. That, that, that would be my, my parental advice. If you could take this, the, the game out of your school and you'd still be happy, boy, think about how happy you'd be from a soccer standpoint. If you're just walking on the field, I think was your other question, go enjoy it. Why, why is college, why is playing, playing the sport you love in college any different than playing the sport you love in high school or at the academy level or at the U10 level, <laughs> right? Uh, because I told you earlier, if you're miserable at the U10 level, you're not going to like soccer. Yeah. If you're miserable at college soccer, you're not going to like soccer, period. Um, it's no different. You got to enjoy what you do and – I mean, how many soccer players do you know, really, that don't enjoy being out there? I mean, this period of time is killing you right now, right? This is yeah. – soccer players want to be on the field. The coaches want to be on the field. The referees want to be on the field. You know, everyone wants to be out. And, and maybe this um, period of time um, will make all of us – look, I, I'm, I'm a soccer analyst, right? I call games right now. It's killing me not being in the booth calling games. I can't wait to get back out but maybe this is a time for me personally to go to realize how much I miss it. Right. Maybe this is me going, yeah, man, I, I'm really lucky doing what I'm doing. Um, I, I will trade with any of your youth soccer players. I'll tell you that right now to get back on the soccer field and be able to run around. Maybe they'll say now, yeah, you know what? I really miss the game and uh, be a little bit more energized when we come out on the other side of this thing. Yeah, great advice there on the college thing. And I think definitely, I think the kids are, are learning how to train on their, on their own uh, at home. That's what this uh, mm. pandemic has done and, and definitely making them appreciate uh, everything that they had before. Sure. Uh, two, more, two more quick subjects, mental toughness. Um, you know, it's something that um, most people talk about at the later stages um, of development. Um, you know, people think that uh, it should be taught or, or it gets taught uh, once you get into college and, and once you get into the pros. Uh, do you think it's, a, it's something that youth coaches uh, should be working on? And I don't mean uh, 
turning them into mental machines, but just making them aware that um, your mind plays a big part and analyzing your thoughts uh, during practice, after practice, during games, uh, just making it a subject into uh, the life of a, of a soccer player, the same way we, we talk about skill, we talk about tactics, we talk about the physical fitness. Um, what about the mental part of the game? What's your uh, take? The, the mental part is equally as important. One, one of the biggest compliments I, I, I think I've ever gotten from a state standpoint, um, everyone would, you know, I've been on national teams and regional teams. I've had so many coaches tell me over the years, if I looked at two guys and they were both the same player, and one of them was from New Jersey, I'm taking the guy from New Jersey, right? Because they always had that, that ability to battle. They always had that willingness to fight and scratch and claw and win. Um, if, you, if you think that you can work on the mental part of the game, when you get to college, for me, it's, it's far too late, right? Um, it, it's far too late because if you think about college, for the most part, not unless you stay home at a local school, but for the most part, you're going into a brand new environment, right? You have to be really, uh, you have to be really set and, and really confident mentally in, in your skill and your physical ability and the way you approach the game, the tactical part of the game. You have to have all of this. Now you're going to learn new things along the way. There's no doubt you're going to play for a new coach. They're going to change maybe the way you make runs, maybe the position that you play. They're going to change all of it. They might change all. Some may not change. Um, but you need to be mentally tough to go through all of those changes, right? You have to understand what you're getting into. I think part of the whole idea, and I, and I have this discussion all the way. I used to have this discussion with Tab Ramos when he was the technical director at U.S. Soccer before he headed into MLS. And we used to talk about all the time, where did the winning part go? Where did the, the fact, because if you talk to kids in Argentina, if you talk to kids in Brazil, if you talk to kids in England or Scotland or anywhere around the world, they learn how to win right away. And, of course, we were coaching at the youth national team level, and we used to say all the time, man, when you get to the national team, you're here to win, right? This is no – yeah, we have to teach you and give, us, give, us, give you our ideas and all of that stuff, but you're here to win. You're a national team. At some point we lost – I still think winning, learning how to win is part of the development of the game for me. Now, the argument is – winning the wrong way, right? What does that mean? Stacking your teams or, or playing in tournaments because you want to get points and all of that stuff. If you could take all of that aside and everything else being equal, learning how to win is equally as important because you mentioned college, forget the pros. We know what that's like, but you mentioned college. How many college coaches are under pressure these days if they don't win, right? So they want people there to win. I asked that we're, we've been doing all these story times. So it's another New Jersey um, a kid. We asked a, a player from DC United, um, and if you remember DC United teams years ago, they had a bunch of Virginia kids, but a lot of New Jersey kids on there. And we asked uh, one guy, who, "Who is the best player you ever played with?" And if you think about those DC United players, uh, Marco Echeverry, Jaime Moreno, Eddie Pope, uh, John Harks, the list goes on and on and on with that group. And we said, who's the best player ever played? Oh, we were, as a matter of fact, we, it was Benny Olsen that we were just talking to, that, that now the head coach of, of D.C. United. And he said, Richie Williams from New Jersey. Okay, yeah. And I said, R really, Richie? We said, you played with all of these great players. He goes, Richie knew how to win. Richie went through a period of time in his career from high school through college through the pros where he won a championship 10 years in a row. Wow from state championships at the youth level to state championships in high school to college, uh, three college national championships to two um, MLS cups in a row in major league soccer. He said, Richie knew how to win. And anyone who goes to study Richie Williams, not, not the biggest player, the smallest player all the time on the field is always clipping at your heels, found a way to survive all the time. And Ben Olsen called him the best player he's ever played with played on the national team for quite some time was one of Bruce's Bruce Arena's you know uh, guys that he really trusted but those are the kind of players that everybody wants to play with in the end and those are the kind of players that coaches want to coach that's awesome great stuff um ODP you played ODP right I did yeah yeah for uh, quite some us, that was that was a dream that was a that was a goal yeah tell us tell us a little bit about your your experience and getting selected and did you make it right off the bat and and how did no. that uh, pave the way? 
So the first couple of years I didn't make it, probably, you know, the 12, 13, 14-ish uh, kind of years. It wasn't until 15 that I made that, then made the regional team. And then they brought all four regions out to uh, Colorado Springs. Um, and we played a four-region tournament. And from that tournament, they were picking the U16 national team that was going to China six months later to play in the World Cup. Um, and uh, it was at that time that I got cut. Uh, for the first time, um, you know, from a national team, and that, but but I'd been in the mix, and I thought to myself, maybe this this is something maybe I should pursue. This is something maybe that I have a chance to to make. But of course, you're 16 years old. You don't, you know. For me, for me, it was great. I got a free trip to Colorado. I ate for free every night. I had a you know hotel. I call my mom and dad, tell them how great it was. And now I look at you know academy kids get this every day, but you know <laughs> guys like us, we didn't get that stuff and. And um, I, uh, that was kind of what sort of pro propelled me, I think, mentally to say, I got a little more to go um, to get to where I want to go, but I got a, I, to, to pass everyone, I got a real long way to go. I've really got to, I got to get to that next level, you know? Um, and that, it was that, that sort of moment, I think, in my career that I, I looked at it and I said, I'm close, but. I still, as close as I am, I want to get to another level. Um, and I just worked hard from there. Excellent. Excellent. Last question. Little 10 year old Johnny comes up to Tony and says, coach Tony, I want to be the best goalkeeper in the world. Advice. Go be the best goalkeeper in the world. You go, go do it. There, there's no reason you can, I can't, someone has to be the best goalkeeper in the world. Someone has to be the best forward in the world. And, and when you're talking about national team, I used to say as a kid, you know, someone's got to be on the national team one day. Why not me? <laughs> right. I'd had no idea. You're just a kid. I'm throwing the ball against the wall. Right. Go make yourself the best. Um, I didn't have video games. I don't know if you did when you were growing up. I didn't have any of this stuff. Uh -huh. I had a wall. I had a soccer ball that was torn to shreds. The only time I played with a good soccer ball is when I went to club practice. And every day I, I, I couldn't get enough uh, of it. And I get there's more distractions today. I completely understand um, I, I, how I got three kids from, from 17 to 22. I get all the distractions and all that stuff. I didn't have all of those things, uh, but kids are still making it. Um, you want to be the best, go and be the best. Um, you know, everyone says over the years, everyone says, you know, what, you know, what advice do you give goal, goalkeepers? Well, first thing, keep the ball out of the net, right? That's the first bit of advice. That's, that's the first thing I can tell you, but work hard, enjoy it. It's not a, it's not a, a position that, um, that you can do and not enjoy. Right. You got to enjoy diving around and throwing your face at people's feet. Like it's not a, it's not a position that you, someone can say, you know, you're going to be the goalkeeper from now on and you're going to like it. You know, you either, you either love the position or you hate the position. But my, my advice would be first, learn as much as you can about the position, right? Get the technical part right, especially at the young age. When I, when I coach young goalkeepers, I used to do quite a bit of it. I don't do much of it anymore because now I'm co you know, I've coached teams for years. But get the technique right. Don't worry about if you can't get to the ball right now. Make sure you're doing it right because eventually, physically, you're going to grow into you're able to get to the ball. Your legs are going to get strong enough to propel you to the ball. Your arms are going to get – your jumping ability is going to get better. Get all of the technique right first. And then when you start growing into your body physically – you have all that other stuff sort of in the bank, you know, you, you've learned all that other stuff and now you can go and make plays. Um, and, and, and don't, I, there, there's no uh, shying away from the fact James that you're on an Island when you're a goalkeeper, right? For some reason, no one remembers the forward when he misses the, the goal from six yards away. Right. But the minute you drop a ball in a game, um, <laughs> they all remember it for some reason. Right. So you have to embrace that. You have to embrace, and, and my, my theory has never changed on goalkeeping. It's, it's what I thought I needed to do and what I think goalkeepers need to do every single day. And I've had this discussion with Tim Howard, with Brad Friedel, with Casey Keller, with Peter Schmeichel not too long ago at the World Cup uh, when I was doing some broadcasting. I mean, guys all around, Gigi Buffon. Um, I've had this discussion, and we all kind of feel the same. The goalkeeper's job is what? Oh, clearly to keep the ball out of the net, but the goalkeeper's job is really simple. 
It's you have to make all the plays that you're supposed to make, and you've got to make one of the plays that you're not supposed to make. And then if you've done that in the game, you've done your job. That's Ten big. other guys' responsibility to get it done. Make all the plays you're supposed to make, so don't make silly mistakes. Right, Avoid those. Everyone expects you to catch the ball when it's right at you. you got to do all that stuff. And the one opportunity that the opponent has – that they think is going in the back of the net and no way a goalkeeper can save it, that's the play you got to make. And that's what separates great goalkeepers from good goalkeepers. That's excellent. Totally excellent. Listen, man, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, I really didn't have to say much. You, you were talking and, and the amount of knowledge that uh, was coming out was amazing. I'm sure the, our audience, parents, coaches, and, and kids are going to get a lot out of this. We appreciate you coming on. Uh, you're a legend, and uh, we thank you for uh, joining us today, okay? Thanks, uh, James. Appreciate anything uh, for the, the, the state of soccer in New Jersey. I'm always here for you guys. Thanks so much. We appreciate it.